Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 16 Purpose No, hell no, absolutely not, no way, never, not gonna happen, uh uh, nope. That was my reaction when JL told me that Michael Mann wanted me to star in his forthcoming Muhammad Ali biopic. The thought of it literally ran a chill down my spine. Ali was one of the most recognized and beloved human beings on earth. A living legend. I was not about to be the dude who ruined the cinematic portrayal of his life and legacy. Besides, everything was going great. I was already the undisputed, undefeated Hollywood box office heavyweight champion of the world. Why roll the dice? Why risk my title? The degree of difficulty in portraying Ali bordered on stupidity. The risk-reward proposition was catastrophically imbalanced towards abysmal global failure and universal eternal embarrassment. In a nutshell, I didn't like my odds. Not only would I have to learn how to fight, but I'd have to learn how to fight like the greatest fighter of all time. Great fighters can't fight like Ali. I had never boxed before. He was over 220 pounds. I barely weighed 190. The dialect and cadence of his voice was singular. No one sounds like Ali. People throughout the world have such fond memories of this revolutionary icon of social justice. There was more video of Muhammad Ali than dang near any other person ever. And not just any old video. Classic, era-defining images seared into the hearts and minds of boxing fans and non-fans alike. Everybody knew Muhammad Ali. Not this one, Jay. I'm not feeling it. I think you should just meet with Michael Mann, JL said. I don't want to be in the room, hear him pitch for an hour, and then have to tell him no. I definitely want to work with him, just not on this. I think you should take the meeting, JL said, as if he hadn't already said it, and as if I hadn't already said no. I paused, and then attempted to clarify my position. No. Hell no. Absolutely not. No way. Never. Not gonna happen. Uh-uh. Nope. We hung up, and I went about my safe, challenge-ducking, risk-averse little life. About a week later, JL called again. I would have to guess that I've spoken to James Lassiter on the telephone over the past few decades, somewhere north of 20,000 times with an average call lasting between 7 and 12 minutes, give or take, which comes out to about 171,000 minutes. This means I've spent roughly 118 days on the phone with JL. So, just as a point of reference, if it were a single call, and we started it by wishing each other a happy new year, by the end of the call, I could ask him what he was doing for Easter. We've talked on the phone about everything. Births, marriages, movies, kids, accidents, music, money, not money, death, dumb, <coughs> and sports. But this 26 second call is definitely in the last or top five. In his standard, unfazed monotone flair, he said, Muhammad Ali asked to speak to you personally. There are rare individuals among us who just know who they are, they know what they are, and they are crystal clear about what they are here to do. Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and even budding change agents like Malala Yousafzai and Greta Thunberg each accepted their divine duties and are willing to suffer for what is right and to benefit others. There's an intoxicating power in their conviction. 
They are calm, they are decisive, and they are loving, even in the midst of conflict and the worst of storms. Just being in their presence inspires your heart toward higher purpose. You want to follow them, you want to serve them, you want to fight alongside them. Muhammad Ali, at the height of his fame and fortune, and in the prime years of his athletic capabilities, gave up everything to oppose the war in Vietnam. He refused induction into the U.S. Army on religious grounds as a conscientious objector, and in 1967, Ali was convicted of draft evasion and sentenced to five years in prison. His passport was seized, he was heavily fined, and he was punished with a three-year ban from boxing. I ain't draft dodging. I ain't burning no flag. I ain't running to Canada. I'm staying right here. You want to send me to jail? Fine. You go right ahead. I've been in jail for 400 years. I could be there for four or five, but I ain't going no 10,000 miles to help murder and kill other poor people. If I want to die, I'll die right here, right now, fighting you if I want to die. You my enemy, not no Chinese, not Viet Cong, not Japanese. You my oppressor when I want freedom. You my oppressor when I want justice. You my oppressor when I want equality. Want me to go somewhere and fight for you? You won't even stand up for me right here in America, for my rights and my religious beliefs. You won't even stand up for me right here at home. I meet with the champ, his wife Lonnie, and his daughters, Layla and May May, in Las Vegas. Ali is seated in front of a bowl of chicken noodle soup. Even though I had no intention of portraying him in the film, I couldn't help but clock his hair, the shape of his lips around the spoon, his left hand balancing himself on the table while eating with his right, and the surprising fluidity of his physical movements. He looks up and sees me, his face collapsing into the iconic Ali scowl, his top teeth comedically biting into his bottom lip. Who let that sucker in here? Ali yells as he jumps up from the table. Clearly the family has been here before. Everyone falls into their roles. Mei Mei steps in front of her father. Come on, daddy, she says. Let's not do this today. Ali pretends to struggle to get past her. This sucker think he can just walk up in here? Let me at him, he said, sounding just like Muhammad Ali. It's Lonnie's turn to step in. She and Mei Mei are now trying to both hold Ali back. Come on, honey, Lonnie said kindly. Just finish your soup. Can we have one day when you're not trying to fight somebody? Not to be outdone, I decide to play along. Listen to your wife, champ, I said. Just eat your soup. You don't want none of what's over here. This puts Ali into a mock rage. That's it. That's it. Y'all move out of my way. I want to hear how he talk with my fist in his mouth. Everyone is roaring with laughter. Who knows how many times the family has played out this scene. But this time, it was Ali's gift to me. He knew I would talk about it for the rest of my life. That's how Ali was. He was always trying to create something that would make you smile forever. He knew he was Muhammad Ali. He knew what that meant to people and there was no length he was unwilling to go in order to autograph your heart with a loving memory. Once he's calmed down, he hugged me. He began checking my biceps and my abs and feeling the bone structure of my hands. He held his hands up like boxing mitts. Let me see you jab, said Muhammad Ali. Well, I haven't trained or anything yet, champ. Come on now, you can't jab with your lips. Let me feel it the greatest fighter of all time insisted. I didn't know anything about how to box or land a punch. I was a southpaw at the time, but I reach out and tap Ali's hand with the saddest right hand jab. And Ali scares the hair out of me as he screams in pain, doubles over, clutching his hand. Did y'all see that? He said, pointing at me. That boy just hit me. I was minding my own business and he struck me. You're going to jail tonight, sucker. 
the room once again erupted in joyous laughter. Ali then announced to Lonnie, He's almost pretty enough to play me. We talked for hours. They got me on a diet, Ali said. Lonnie thinks I'm getting too fat. I peer comically at his stomach. Yeah, look like you got a lot going on over there, champ, I said. Ali put two hands on his belly, looked down at it, and shakes it. Aw oh, man, this ain't nothing but a young girl's playground. I clocked how similar our senses of humor were. Our banter was fluid and comfortable. There was a deep, childlike core to him that harmonized with my own. His heart was transparent to me. Ali told me about his childhood, how his life changed when he learned how to fight, his Olympic wins, his difficulties with women, the strained relationship with his father. I was shocked by how much I innately understood him. The actor in me thought, oh, I might be able to do this. I don't want anybody else to do this movie, Ali says. I've been telling people no for years, but I would be honored if you would tell my story to the world. Michael Mann is one of my all-time favorite filmmakers. Heat, The Last of the Mohicans, The Insider, Manhunter, Miami Vice. The meeting was in a small warehouse that he'd converted into his office in LA. The main section was a 3,000 square foot Muhammad Ali war room. Thousands of pictures, books, memorabilia, magazine articles, stacks of overstuffed color-coded binders, videos on multiple televisions, interviews on one, Ali's jab on a loop on another, a heavy bag, weights, wraps, gloves, and jump ropes surrounded a perfectly lit boxing ring in the center. It looked like an FBI Quantico situation room. The level of detail was mind-boggling. When I arrive, Michael is mid-conversation with an elderly Italian man. Four black leather jackets hang on mannequins in front of them. They're in some dispute. Michael wanted an identical jacket to one he'd seen in a picture of Ali from the late 60s. The Italian man was the now 75-year-old tailor who had made the original jacket. He had sent four versions of the jacket none of which had met Michael's approval, so Michael flew the man in from Chicago to discuss the problem. The tailor is vehemently defending the precision of his work, pointing back and forth between the 1960s picture and the jackets. All four jackets were identical to my eye, by the way. Michael, with all due respect, the tailor says, I made the original jacket and I made these four replicas. Everything is sourced and constructed exactly as it was 40 years ago. Something's off, Michael says. It's not right. As the debate intensifies, it suddenly hits Michael. I see the problem, Michael Eurekas, pointing to Ali's collar in the photo. The stitching on the collar of the replicas is single thread. But look, in the photo, the stitching is double thread. The tailor squints and realizes that Michael is correct. He then remembers that in the mid-1970s, the fabric of the thread changed and he stopped using the double stitching technique. He shook Michael's hand and set off to make the jacket right. As it turns out, Michael Mann is a seventh level researcher. I had never before, nor since, met a more thorough cinematic scientist. We sat at Michael's desk. I met Malcolm X in 1963, Michael said. I'm one year younger than Ali, so generationally, I was pissed off about the same things he was pissed off about. I'm not looking to idolize him. That would diminish his humanity. This is not a story about boxing. It's about politics, war, religion, and rebellion. I want to create an inside view, an intimate perspective. 
I want to see his despondency when his fortunes are at their absolute most abysmal. I have no idea how to become Muhammad Ali, I admitted. Well, fortunately, you don't have to worry about that, Michael said. I will create the curriculum that will render you as Ali. All you have to do is follow the syllabus. Michael explained that he would do all of the research, build a world-class team of teachers, experts, and trainers. He would be in charge of my schedule. He would surround me with people who had actually been there with Ali. He would pick my clothes, he would build a cast, he would even choose the music I would listen to. All I had to do was commit. I loved the sound of that recipe. Take one firm commander, mix in some clear orders, just add discipline, and shake thoroughly. I could definitely do that. But it's not going to be easy, Michael said. It's going to take everything you've got. And then just a little bit more than that. Do you have any boxing experience? None whatsoever, I said. Michael, unfazed, maybe even a little inspired by that damning revelation, reaches for the phone on his desk. Is Darrell still here? He asks, knowing dang well that Darrell is still here. Good. Have him come in. Darrell Foster is the individual hardest man I've ever met in my life. Born and raised on the streets of Washington, D.C., Darrell survived a horrific childhood marred by violence and abuse. <coughs> it's a dang miracle I ain't dead or in jail, he'd say. If it wasn't for boxing, man, ain't no telling. These gloves saved my life. Darrell was an athletic prodigy. He started boxing at age 10, and within a few years, he was the best amateur boxer in the country at his weight class. At 13, he won the Golden Gloves, the equivalent of the Super Bowl for amateur boxers. He was undefeated. He had college scholarships lined up. His coaches were even eyeing the Olympics. Then, at 17, Darrell Foster nearly killed a guy in the ring pounding him after the referee had told him to stop. Just like that, the sport that Durrell owed his life to was taken away from him. He was banned from competition. Durrell became a trainer. There too, he excelled. He had grown up with Sugar Ray Leonard, one of the best boxers of all time, and had been his training partner, helping him win an Olympic gold medal and become world champion in five different weight classes. Once Sugar Ray retired, Darrell moved out to Hollywood and began consulting on films. There, he helped train Woody Harrelson and Antonio Banderas in the 1999 film Play It to the Bone. And in 2000, when Michael Mann needed someone to do the heavy lifting of turning Will Smith into Muhammad Ali, Darrell was Michael's top choice to carry that load. Darrell enters the room. 5'10", 190 pounds, imagine if you could cross a pit bull with a brick. The Omega symbol is branded proudly on his upper left arm. He's a Q-Dog, a member of the Omega Sci-Fi fraternity. They're as hard as they come. His posture is rigid, straight up and down, head high, shoulders back, like a soldier, like a general. His hands, at their default setting, halfway to a fist, just in case. His presence is intense. He's already looking me up and down, unconvinced. He holds his hand out to greet me. Not a handshake, a closed fist. We pound. How tall are you? Daryl says. I'm 6'2". What you weighing right now? I'm probably 190. Yeah, that's not enough, he says, almost to himself, making his way to the boxing ring. Take your shoes off. Hop up in here. What? I have jeans on. And jewelry. I'm fly right now. But Darrell is already in the ring, waiting for me. Michael Mann is grabbing a video camera. Darrell slides the focus mitts on, and he claps them together an explosion echoing through the cavernous warehouse. The reverberation seems to say, 
Hurry the <coughs> up, bling boy. Darrell didn't give two <coughs> that I was the biggest movie star in the world. In fact, he almost saw it as the biggest problem. Michael Mann helps me on with the 14 ounce gloves and I step into the ring. This dude better not hit me. 90% of the people on Earth are right-handed, Darrell said in a voice that seemed to be louder than necessary. That means that if you're going to get knocked out in the street, most of the time, it's going to be with a loop and overhand right. In order to deliver that punch, a person's right foot got to be set back. That's how they're going to get the leverage to throw it. You see that in the street all the time when is beefing. So when you see them shift their weight, you know what's coming. Your rear cranium bone's the hardest bone in your skull. So while we go and practice today, put your left ear down to your shoulder, and we go and break their hand on the top of your head. Then you go and fire your right hand straight back. For about 30 minutes, we repeated that sequence. Darrell was pretending like we were in the street. He would talk, <coughs> then shift his right foot back, throw the overhand right. I would time it so that I caught the mid on the back left section of my cranium the hardest bone of my skull, and then I'd fire my right hand back at the center of his mitt. You master that, Darrell said. You gonna stretch most mother in the street. Is that a move Ali did? I said. Don't you worry about Ali. I gotta teach you how to fight first. Something about that promise rang deep within me. He was going to teach me how to fight for real. The thought of being able to physically defend myself induced reverence and surrender to Durrell's leadership. Michael and Durrell share a silent look. They've seen enough. Clearly, they need to talk about me behind my back. Durrell begins to remove their mitts and step out of the ring. I'll see you tomorrow, Durrell says. What are we doing tomorrow, I say. Five at five. We only got a year. We need to get started. Darrell's style of training is full immersion. He doesn't ask anybody to do anything that he doesn't do. Over the next year, he ran every mile, jumped every rope, lifted every weight, sparred as many rounds, every moment of training right by my side. He ate when I ate, he slept when I slept, he worked when I worked. Often, he would quote Edgar Guest's poem, The Sermons We See. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. This was not a dude I thought was going to quote poetry. Durrell had a no actors rule. He set up an authentic fight camp. Every boxing rule in the film would be cast with active, professional fighters. Former heavyweight champ Michael Bent as Sonny Liston, James Lights Out Tony, a three-weight class champ as Joe Frazier, IBF cruiserweight champ Alfred Cole as Ernie Terrell, and 7-1 heavyweight contender Charles Shufford Jr. as George Foreman. These would be the anchor fights of the film. We ain't doing no Hollywood bull <coughs> around here. This is a real fight camp, Darrell said. We are preparing for a title shot. <coughs> a movie. Everybody knew we were doing this for Muhammad Ali. Every fighter felt indebted and dedicated to the champ. There was an energy around the project that I had never experienced before. The purpose of the film had a unifying and electrifying effect on all of us. That first week was brutal. I had just finished a 30 minute footwork drill and I was exhausted, so I laid down in the ring. Darrell saw me from across the gym and snapped. Hey, get the <coughs> up. I stood as he made his way over to the ring. Do not get comfortable with your back on that canvas, he said. You fight how you train. You fight how you train was one of Darrell's central axioms. You do everything how you do one thing, he'd say. Drell didn't want me to get comfortable with my back on the canvas in case I ever got knocked down. He wanted lying down in a boxing ring to feel utterly foreign to me. 
just in case I ever found myself lying down in a boxing ring. His position was, Dreams are built on discipline. Discipline is built on habits. Habits are built on training. And training takes place in every single second and every situation of your life. How you wash the dishes, how you drive a car, how you present a report at school or at work. You either do your best all the time or you don't. If the behavior has not been trained and practiced, then the switch will not be there when you need it. Training is for the purpose of habituating reactions to extreme circumstances, Darrell said. When situations get hot, you can't rely on your thinking mind. You must have habituated reflexive responses that kick in without the necessity of thought. Never detrain your killer instincts. The Sonny Liston and Joe Frazier fights feature early in the movie, so Michael Bent and James Tony were the first fighters I trained with. Darrell and I had spent the first three months with just the two of us working on the fundamentals, footwork, posture, cardio, and developing the fluidity of the classic Ali jab, what Ali called the snake lick because it mimicked the strike of a cobra. Michael Mann brought in a brain scientist to help with what he called burning new neural passages. The scientist created a 20-minute loop of the quintessential Ali footwork and jab. I would sit in a pitch-black room, watching the loop twice a day, staring at the repeated movement until it was seared on my brainstem. The first few months of training were in front of mirrors, in empty gyms, and in solitary locations. We ran at altitude in the snow in Colorado, in combat boots. I could barely breathe. Darrell had run the same distance, but looked like he had just awakened from a refreshing nap. I had to take a knee. Darrell didn't care much for my little break time in the snowbank. Write his name, Darrell said. What? I said, struggling for a sip of oxygen. Ali, write it. I leaned down and slowly began to write. A. L. I. Durrell snapped a picture. You need to remember why we're suffering, he said as he began to run. When the group training camp began, it was no longer just Durrell and me. For the first time, I was gloved up across the ring from seasoned boxing champions. Durrell whispered to me as he laced my gloves. These are not actors. These are instinctual fighters. Their hands will just fly before they even know it. The first rule of boxing, protect yourself at all times. In the mirror, I was starting to look like Muhammad Ali. I was 223 pounds of muscle now, with a one rep max bench press of 365 pounds. But as soon as another fighter stepped in the ring, my fear wouldn't allow me to maintain my forward posture. I began leaning back at the waist too much. Don't compromise your spine angle. Lean in, Darrell yells from outside the ring. Just stay off the train tracks. Create angles. But Michael Bent was not inspiring me in the least to lean in toward him. I decided <coughs> it just lean in and my simple two-inch spinal adjustment triggers Michael Bent's right hand. I see it coming, but it's too late. I only have enough time to put my chin down a little and brace for impact. Bent's right hand lands high on my forehead, but because of my forward posture, my head doesn't snap back. Instead, it compresses down onto my spinal column. I feel an electrical shock shoot from the top of my spine down both arms ending at my elbows. I have an alkaline, metallic taste in my mouth, like I've just licked a 9-volt battery. Fortunately, Ben sees that I'm hurt and doesn't follow with the left hook he hit Tommy Morrison with to become heavyweight champ. This was the first time I'd been truly hit. Every fighter in the room knew that this was a make-or-break moment, fight or flight. Everybody went silent. Darrell calmly stepped up into the ring and sat me in the corner. 
You good? He said, knowing dang well I was not good. Michael Bent appeared over Darrell's shoulder. You alright, God? He said in his thick Brooklyn accent. All I could think was, where the are my car keys? As I look back on my life, I see funny stories, beautiful experiences, tragic losses, magnificent victories, all held together by a handful of pivotal moments, critical choices that completely altered the trajectory of my journey. In that ring with Michael Bent, a switch got flipped that would take a decade to get unflipped. The warrior within me took complete command of everything in my life. I stood up off the stool, looked at Bent, and said, Good shot. Let's work. The one year of training and the five months of filming of Ali was the most grueling mental, physical, and emotional test of my entire career, but also the most transformative. The filming of Ali spanned seven cities and two continents. We began in LA, did two weeks in Chicago, quick shoots in New York and Miami, and then it was time to bring it home. We were heading to the motherland. We were heading to Africa, a place I'd never been. The final sequence of Ali was shot in Mozambique. Michael Mann is a purist. He wanted to shoot in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the actual rumble in the jungle took place. But the raging civil war there redirected the production to Maputo. Michael wanted the cast to feel what it was like to fly together and arrive together. Jamie Foxx, Jeffrey Wright, Nona Gay, Mikkel T. Williamson, Ron Silver, Mario Van Peebles, John Voigt, and Michael Michelle, and me, JL, Charlie, and my whole squad. Michael was trying to orchestrate a similar emotional experience to the one that Ali and his crew had had. This was a part of his cinematic genius, and it worked. It is difficult to overestimate the power of a first experience in Africa. Two steps off the airplane, and I'm already crying. I'm not sure if it was my cells or my soul that recognized their origin, but it was visceral and overwhelming. We found a quiet place just outside the airport in Maputo, Mozambique. We all huddled, held hands, knelt down, and kissed the ground. One of the airport workers yelled out from the other side of the fence, Welcome home, brothers! Nelson Mandela has invited us to dinner, JL said, in his regular <coughs> JL voice. I couldn't even respond. His current wife is Greka Machel, the former first lady of Mozambique, he said, as though he was reading from Wikipedia. They have a house near here. J, you gotta start putting some expression on it when you tell me <coughs> like that, I said. I had felt the world moving differently around this film. Ali's name alone opened doors in a way I'd never experienced. It engendered the goodwill of every person we approached. His legacy lubricated the logistical wheels of the production. Deal negotiations, permits, locations, casting. Everything and everybody wanted to serve Ali. Whatever we needed to tell his story properly, the answer was always yes. It wasn't because of his fame or his boxing titles. It wasn't about success or money. The always positive reaction was about people's deep recognition and reverence for a life lived in integrity. In the face of grievous injustice, profound prejudice, and financial devastation, he never wavered from the convictions of his principles. He was the greatest fighter of all time, yet would always say, my religion is love. Everybody wanted to be a part of honoring him. I had experienced the magnetism of fame. I knew well the allure of celebrity, the attraction of money, but this was my first dose of the power of purpose 
and the radiance of service. Nelson Mandela had spent 27 years unjustly imprisoned for opposing the South African apartheid regime. His eyes had been damaged from hard labor in the lime quarries. Upon the toppling of the apartheid system, he was released from Victor Verster prison and was subsequently elected president of South Africa. One of his first official undertakings was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings, where the architects and the perpetrators of the heinous system of racial segregation and brutality were put on trial. And in a controversial and extraordinary act, Nelson Mandela offered forgiveness and amnesty to those who would confess their atrocities. He was, however, widely criticized for this stance, but as he wrote in 2012, in the end, reconciliation is a spiritual process which requires more than just a legal framework. It has to happen in the hearts and minds of people. The night of the dinner came. Twenty cast and crew members made our way to his suburban home in Maputo. As I entered, Charlie Mack and JL by my side. My eyes once again welled with tears. You don't need to cry, man, Charlie Mack said. You belong here. Hello, Willie, Mr. Mandela said, joyfully bringing me into his arms. Come, you will sit with me. Madiba as he's known among his closest friends and family, grabbed my hand and walked me around his home. We must have held hands for a full ten minutes. Men didn't hold hands like this where I grew up. The show of affection was overwhelming. I introduced him to everyone. He, in turn, introduced me to his wife, Greca, and his family. He took his seat at the head of the dining room table and sat me to his right hand. We all ate and talked and laughed, and he praised us for honoring Ali. Then, as the meal wound down, Madiba began to recount in vivid detail the horrors of apartheid in his 27 years in prison, 18 of them on Robben Island. As inmates, once a month we were shown a film, movies from all over the world, but American cinema was my particular favorite. There was a film called In the Heat of the Night, starring Sidney Poissier, and in the middle of the movie, there was a strange glitch. I could tell that the film had been edited. I was so intrigued. I used all my angles and connections on the outside to determine what had been taken out. It took weeks, but finally I was informed that Sidney Poissier had slapped a white man in the face. Something in my spirit was energized. If black men in American cinema are standing on equal ground with their white counterparts, then it was only a matter of time. The film empowered me. It inspired me. And then he paused. He looked directly into my eyes and said, Never underestimate the power of what you do. After dinner, cast and crew are milling about. The evening is winding down. Mediva and I are sharing a quiet moment. He sits calmly, taking in the room. I catch myself staring. He has the same little smile and trance-like countenance that Gigi displayed every Sunday in Resurrection Baptist Church. The soft rise in the corners of his mouth betraying an invincible serenity. My heart jumped at the recognition. He soon feels my gaze and turns his attention to me. I ask him, jokingly, but in all seriousness, what's that look? He peered into me as if trying to discern whether I had accidentally asked a good question or, if I had asked in earnest, was I ready to hear the answer? If you will come and spend time with me, Madiba said, I will show you. If you will come and spend time with me, I will show you. Madiba's words lingered as we prepared to film the final scenes of Ali, the rumble in the jungle, Ali versus Foreman. In a perfect example of art imitating life, this was the most difficult fight of Ali's career. 
and also the most difficult fight to capture on film. The sequence took two weeks to shoot. Michael Mann had an entire stadium refurbished and over 20,000 extras in the stands. With the lights and the humidity, it was over 105 degrees in the ring and I lost 11 pounds on the first day of shooting. That meant I had to double the portions of chicken breast, broccoli, and brown rice I'd been enjoying for months. One weekend, everyone was sitting around in the house we had rented just outside Maputo. I had been training with Durrell and the other fighters for more than a year, and everything was coming down to this final sequence. The Africa experience was the culmination of the entire journey. My boys Belail Salaim, Dave Haynes, and Mike Sakio flew in and brought a spark of new energy that I desperately needed at the time. But while everyone was thinking of this as a regular movie shoot, Darrell saw it as a fight camp. My boy Belail ended up losing 100 pounds during the training and filming. Dave Haynes was my stand-in. In Hollywood terms, that means he would stand in the spots that I would eventually be so the crew could set the lights and the shots and get everything ready. Dave so impressed Michael Mann that Michael gave him the role of Ali's brother, Rahman, in the movie. I accidentally gave Dave a concussion during a sparring session. My boy Mike had been a writer on The Fresh Prince. I had hired him to video document our entire African experience. As far as he was concerned, he was here in a domestic capacity, and accordingly, he had had a case of Snickers shipped in from Philly. Durrell exploded. <coughs> you eaten a <coughs> Snickers, he said, which for Mike was confusing on two levels. One, in his mind he was just a videographer, and two, He's white. Will is about to be in a ring with a 235 pound mother <coughs> punching at his head. This is the challenge of his lifetime. We all benefiting from his suffering and you stuck in the <coughs> pleasure principle. He don't need to be seeing yo <coughs> chomping on no <coughs> candy bar. You either helping or you're hurting. And if you're not committing to helping, then you need to take your <coughs> the <coughs> home. African side note number one, Mike ultimately trained into the best shape of his life and thank God because as great a writer as he is, as a videographer, he failed bad. One time on safari we were chased by an elephant and Mike was so terrified he couldn't pick the camera up and all we got was the audio of Mike screaming and Charlie Mack saying, that's a mother <coughs> elephant, 11 times in a row. Darrell and JL were perfectly in sync. JL knew the magnitude of this endeavor. He had been fighting for that kind of order for years. Charlie's father had been a boxer. Charlie had been around boxing gyms his whole life. He understood the idea of supporting the champ to secure our collective win. Charlie and Dave even started calling me champ. Omar never trusted anybody anyway. So he loved that Durrell was defending the space. This fight camp support the chant mentality became the new law of our group. Everybody had to run five at five. Everybody had to work out in the gym. Everybody had to eat right. Everybody had to read and study and offer new ideas. Everybody had to live a disciplined life to reach for the best version of themselves. Otherwise, they had to go the <coughs> home. The unified mission of telling Muhammad Ali's story established a new fundamental way of being that would extend within our group far beyond the completion of Ali. The infrastructure in Mozambique was not equipped at the time to sustain a production the size of Ali. We literally had to rebuild and refurbish hotels and residences to accommodate cast and crew. Most of that crew and assets had to be brought in from neighboring South Africa. This created a subtle tension. A mostly white South African production contingent working for a mostly African-American cast and crew 
backed by a 100% black Mozambican support staff. The racial and nationalistic frictions were simmering from day one. But there was an immediate camaraderie between the African-American cast members and the Mozambicans. Jamie Foxx dang near became a local. He went out every night. Jeffrey Wright spent every free moment with artists, poets, and musicians. He was always bringing somebody to the set who had blown his mind. Africa side note number two. My barber, Pierce, ended up falling in love and getting married to a beautiful Mozambican girl named Iva. They have two gorgeous children, Madiu and Gael. We all took a liking to a young production assistant named Jorge Maciel. He was in his early 20s and had one of those personalities that you never forget. Everybody liked him, which made him the de facto leader of the Mozambican PAs. African side note number three. Jorge told us he wanted to move to the United States. We told him, sure Jorge, if you get there, we got you. Six months after Ali rapped, Jorge appeared in Los Angeles. He moved in with Pierce, and I financed a cleaning company that he owned and operated for five years, until he felt he had gathered sufficient business knowledge to return and build in his native Mozambique. We financed the trucking company that he owns and operates to this day. The experience of Africa was spiritual, transformative, and deeply emotional for all of us. One day, Jorge came to Charlie Mack and informed him that one of the white South African crew members had assaulted a young Mozambican PA. The South African crew member was responsible for cleaning and maintaining the bathrooms on set. Apparently, the Mozambican boy had allegedly left urine drops on the toilet seat. The crew member chased him down, grabbed him by the scruff of his neck, took him back to the bathroom, and allegedly wiped the toilet seat with his face. Charlie comes to my trailer in a rage. Yo, come with me right now. Mother <coughs> is tripping. I didn't know which mother and what kind of tripping, but I've known Charlie long enough to know it wasn't good. News of the incident was building on set, and a crowd was forming around the bathrooms. By the time we reach the scene, there are 10 of us. To the left are 15 Mozambican PAs, and to the right, 30 white South African crew members. Charlie Mack walks right into the middle. Who did it? He says. The Mozambicans point to the accused crew member. We all turn and face him. Yo, you put somebody's head in the toilet? Charlie says, towering over the guy. This doesn't have anything to do with you, the man says. Oh, it got everything to do with me. I want my head in the toilet, Charlie said, now invading the man's personal space. Feeling uncomfortable with the proximity, the man takes two steps backward, which prompts Charlie to take three steps forward. Now we are fully squared off with the South African crew members each of us picking who we're going to stretch if it kicks off. What I gotta do to get my head in the toilet? Other crew members attempt to de-escalate the situation. Let's all just turn it down a little bit, which only prompts Charlie to turn it up. I want my head in the toilet! What do I have to do to get my head in the toilet? Your mother's a mother! <laughs> Will that do it? Charlie says, screaming directly into the face of the accused. Your mother's a- <coughs> Will that get my head in the toilet? You like putting mother- <coughs> Heads in the toilet? Put my head in the toilet. Just tell me what I gotta do. If I knock your- <coughs> Front teeth out, will that get my head in the toilet? Just then, Michael Mann walks up. He had heard of the incident brewing. He was probably the only person in all of Mozambique, except probably Nelson Mandela, who could have gotten water on this fire. Michael pointed to me and then to the head of the South African crew. You and you 
in my office, please. Everybody else, go back to work. That guy needs to go home right now, I said. It doesn't work like that, the appointed crew spokesperson said. And with all due respect, this doesn't have anything to do with you. We will handle it internally. You can handle it wherever you want to handle it, I said. But you gonna handle it with your racist friend gone. He's fired. He cannot be here. I agree with that, Michael said. That kind of behavior will not be tolerated on my set. You arrogant Americans and your foolish racism, he said. Every confrontation doesn't fit into your childish conception of race. So wait a minute, I said. Let me understand. You're saying that he would have done the same thing had it been a white crew member? I'm saying that you couldn't possibly comprehend the complexity of what's going on here. Okay, I said. Well, how about this? That mother <coughs> fired just for being a <coughs> head. Well, the man said, if he goes, we all go. The all he was speaking of was about 100 members of our South African crew. If they were to leave, that would shut our film down. Tens of millions of dollars down the drain. This was a potentially catastrophic threat. My heart pounded. My mind raced. I had promised Muhammad Ali that I would bring his story to the world. If I let the crew quit, the project could be doomed. And then it hit me like a left hook from heaven. This is Ali. This moment is the whole point. Muhammad Ali gave up everything for this very purpose. <coughs> this movie. Ali would never want his film to come to the screen on the back of a 17-year-old boy's head in a toilet. I was crystal clear. Then all of you mother <coughs> can go the <coughs> home, I said. I will spend every dime of my fee to fly a crew from the US, but what we're not going to have is people's heads getting shoved into toilets on Muhammad Ali's movie. Go home. With that, I left Michael's office. Michael was 100% behind me. Ultimately, only about 20% of the crew left. Michael and I ended up splitting the overages. It was a few million dollars between us, but it felt like a no-brainer. I was coming into an understanding of the power of purpose. Purpose and desire can seem similar, but they are very different, sometimes even opposing forces. Desire is personal, narrow, and pointed, and tends towards self-preservation, self-gratification, and short-term gains and pleasures. Purpose is wider, broader, a longer-term vision encompassing the benefit of others, something outside of yourself you're willing to fight for. There have been many times in my life where I was acting from a place of desire, but I'd fully convinced myself that it was purpose. Desire is what you want. Purpose is the flowering of what you are. Desire tends to weaken over time whereas purpose strengthens the more you lean into it. Desire can be depleting because it's insatiable. Purpose is empowering. It's a stronger engine. Purpose has a way of contextualizing life's unavoidable sufferings and making them meaningful and worthwhile. As Viktor Frankl wrote, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning such as the meaning of a sacrifice. A noble aim engenders positive feelings. When we pursue what we believe to be a profound and valuable goal, it stirs the best parts of ourselves and others. I am not a man who is prone to regrets, but every year for the rest of his life, Nelson Mandela had sent me a message urging me to come spend some time with him. I am an old man, don't delay. But some deep part of me felt unworthy. The world needs Nelson Mandela. Who was I to take up one more second of that man's time? I'd seen Madiba many times over the years. A charity event here, 
an awards presentation there, only five and ten minutes at a time. On December 5th, 2013, I was on a promotional tour in Sydney, Australia. I was watching the TV when the current South African president, Jacob Zuma, appeared on the screen. Fellow South Africans, Zuma said, our beloved Nelson Roli Lala Mandela, the founding president of our democratic nation, has departed. Nelson Mandela died in Johannesburg, South Africa, just before 9 p.m. local time. He had been surrounded by his family and closest friends. He was 95 years old. Madiba was gone. This was one of the greatest moments of regret in my entire life. How could I not have taken him up on his offer? Over the years, I've done deep soul searching around that question. He held me in the purest affection and highest regard. It was scary to me. He saw something in me that I hadn't yet seen in myself. I think subconsciously, I didn't want to spend extended time with him for fear that I wouldn't live up to his impression of me. Maybe I thought he'd ask me to do something or change something about my life that I'd be unable or unwilling to change. Madiba thought I was special. I didn't want to prove him wrong. He has since appeared to me multiple times in dreams, always wearing that same knowing smile. His energy seemed to communicate, I'm still here whenever you are ready.